afternoon. My name is Ann Mosley. I am the director and curator for the Sangamon Experience at the University of Illinois at Springfield. And it has been my great pleasure to talk to you about a lot of our community trailblazers within our African American community here in Central Illinois. I've been focusing quite a bit on uh, Sangamon County, specifically the Springfield area, because there are a lot of people to choose from uh, from the demographic. But if you have an African-American in your community that you'd like to highlight, um, feel free to send an email or even comment um, within this program if there are any individuals that you would recommend uh, that we dive into and learn more about. There are so many stories here in Central Illinois uh, that we can discover and learn um, about their history and we're able to share those with others and uh, we won't know about them until you share with us as well. So uh, to get us started today, I do want to uh, let you know that uh, while the program is going on, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments and I'd be more than happy to address them. In addition to that, um, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question while um, you are watching the program, feel free to shoot an email um, to the Sangamon Experience at uis.edu and we'd be happy to uh, answer your question. Now, today, um, I'm actually really excited because we are going to be focusing on the arts and humanities, and we will be focusing on a few individuals who created beautiful works of art that also had extreme power. And in addition to that, we will be talking about some musicians who made a huge impact on the surrounding area with their uh, wonderful talent of uh ragtime music, as well as jazz and uh, contemporary music as well. In addition, we'll be highlighting some major projects that are going on right now in regards to um, photography collections that are um, thankfully being funded by grants, uh, both in the state and nationally. Um, and we will be talking about some of the work that's being done there. Um, and as always, as I go through the program, um, I'm going to showcase where you can find some in more information about these key individuals, but also where you'll be able to learn more about projects going on. Um, and in addition to that, uh, just the wealth of resources that we have here in Central Illinois in regards to our local citizenry. So to get us started, I'm gonna bring up my PowerPoint here. All right. So you'll see that we have our, our main theme here, which is our um, we're celebrating Black History Month and we're focusing on African-Americans and the arts. Now, um, as we move forward, I do have um, some music that I'm hopefully going to be able to share with you. Um, and if it doesn't work, I'll make sure to add links in the comments so you get a chance to listen to some of the music. Um, but first, we're going to start off with the power of art art. Um, here in the Springfield area, we have the Springfield Art Association. There's also um, a few art associations within Jacksonville. Uh, we have them in the surrounding communities that um, are here in Central Illinois. Art plays a huge role. Uh, one of my favorite things to see in uh, downtown Springfield are some of the pop-up murals that have been um, jumping up uh, within our communities. Uh, artists are taking to the walls of our downtown area and are decorating them. Um, and if you ever get a chance to go down Art Alley in Springfield, Illinois, um, you'll get a chance to see uh, some of the amazing work by the artists that are in our area. Uh, in addition to that, the Springfield Art Association has a number of wonderful programs that go on um, that allow people to express their works of art. And even uh, you can take some classes there as well uh, to kind of hone your craft or if you're like myself and are very uh, challenged when it comes to creating wonderful works of art, um, they do have teachers there that will be happy to help you. Um, but the Springfield Art Association has been able to allow people to flourish quite a bit um, through the work of art um, and history as well. 
Now, uh, the artist that I'm going to be talking about first has a very harrowing story. And it's so interesting to read it because it is uh, a story of a person who comes out of bondage and discovers his love for drawing. And he comes in to Illinois with this passion of wanting to create. And his name is Dennis Williams. Now, Dennis Williams uh, was born an enslaved person in Mississippi. Uh, he became, became an acclaimed artist in the 1870s and 1880s in Springfield. Um, here I have some examples of his work. Um, you see the uh, postcard of the two kittens. Um, we also have um, his advertisements that he put in the journal um, and register. Now, at the time, there were two different newspapers, so he obviously had to have advertisements in both. Um, we also have his letterhead, which is below uh, the advertisement. Now, growing up as an enslaved individual, uh, he was self-taught. And uh, that was, for the, for the most part, it was because teachers refused to accept African-Americans as students. Um, most of the time, they had to obtain their own materials and uh, just kind of try it out and uh, experiment and figure out um, what they like to create and how they like to create it. Now, uh, Williams eventually set up a studio on the downtown square. He was advertising himself as, quote, the old reliable crayon artist, unquote. Uh, he won commissions to do portraits of many prominent residents of Springfield um, in Illinois, uh, here in Springfield, Illinois. Um, among them was U.S. Senator John Logan and Abraham Lincoln's advisor and close friend, Judge David Davis. Now, uh, according to the Illinois State Register uh, in September of 1882, Mr. Williams was a born artist. It was a natural gift for him. And he's very successful in catching features uh, and the most perfect expressions of his subjects. Uh, he blends the lights and shades so harmoniously as to give exquisite tone to his work. Now, Williams uh, was born on Christmas day in 1851. Uh, in Mississippi to Margaret McGinnis, who was from Kentucky, and Dennis Williams, whose last name also may have been Crawford. Now, being uh, a part of the slave population, um, it's difficult to figure out names at times uh, because majority of these individuals took on the last name of their masters at, um, who they were enslaved to. Um, and in some rare cases, they do have their own last names that they have created on their own. Now, um, there is some evidence that um, his uh, father could have also been his slave owner. Um, he was listed as mulatto when he was arrested at, towards the end of his life when he was traveling out to the, the West Coast. Um, eventually, when he did pass away, there is a little bit of a mystery behind it. Um, but before I go into... Um, hit the ending of his life, I do want to talk quite a bit about his actual work. Now, there's not a lot of evidence of his work um, as major portraits. And the reason for that is because at the time, his, his art wasn't viewed uh, as collectible. Now, a lot of his work we can find um, in newspapers, in journals, um, and we can even find them uh, in advertisements. And in addition to that, in private collections. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if, if uh, his work just started popping up uh, later on um, throughout the years, because uh, a lot of the items he created were personal to the individual who wanted their portrait created, um, but it was also personal because he did do a number of drawings of deceased individuals. Um, and these were commissioned by individuals who wanted their loved ones to be um, basically embodied in a work of art. Um, that was, this was quite common after the Civil War um, because a lot of people didn't have images of their loved ones. Um, sometimes they were lucky to have a carta vista, uh, which is pretty much like a photograph today, just 
made out of a different medium. Um, and you had some individuals who didn't have the opportunity to get those images taken. And so um, what they would do is if they do have the body of the individual, they are able to have an artist do a recreation of that. And Dennis Williams was able to provide that for families. Now in 1881, uh, we have a wonderful book that was created. I use it quite often in my research and studying local history of Sangamon County um, because it is known as the history of Sangamon County, Illinois. Um, and it's a book that not only provides a history of the county, but a history of individuals who lived in the county, specifically early settlers. Now, um, the History of Sangamon County outlines William's early passion for art and his strug struggle to make a living of it. Um, the history devotes more than a full page to William's life uh, to a point. Um, it indicates his prominence in Springfield, um, but it also provides a few errors. And we find this sometimes in the record when certain individuals were uh, and their lives were embellished. Um, whether for good or for bad. Um, but there's also a few missing pieces within William's story. Now, when William started off his life um, here in Illinois, uh, he earned his money by shining shoes, um, but he spent his spare time learning to draw. Um, his Most of his work um, and in the beginning were crayon sketches, and those were in the 1870s. Um, and his first sketch was good enough that he was able to put it on display in, uh, at the Simmons bookstore on the square, um, in Springfield. And however, uh, according to his history profile, it doesn't really talk about some of his other works that he created. Uh, we don't really find those out until we start looking in newspaper accounts. Um, now... At, shortly after he started uh, dabbling in drawings uh, with crayons, um, he abandoned the idea of becoming an artist. Um, he was very discouraged. Um, and the main portion was that he just didn't have a lot of money and he couldn't find a way to make funds uh, by drawing. And what ended up happening was that he ended up picking up low uh, low level occupations. Um, he ended up shining shoes. He was a, he uh, ended up becoming a boot blacker, uh, which means he would um, shine shoes, but he'd also color them as well. Um, the people among whom he lived, with a few honorable exceptions, um, sneered at his um, pretensions. So his and they were laughing at the fact that he wanted to become an artist. Um, they called him derogatory names, which I won't repeat on this program. Um, and they thought it was preposterous for him to become an artist. But uh, regardless of what people thought, he did pick up his pencil again and started drawing. Um, he was able to secure a room um, at the rear end of a building on the southeast corner of the downtown square. Um, and when he was done shining shoes, uh, shoes, sorry, um, and blacking boots, um, he would go back and he would try to copy some picture that he was able to pick up for, um, next to nothing at a bookstore or, um, some of the cheap lithographs that were sold. Now, by 1883, uh, when Williams was about 32, uh, he married a woman by the name of Olivia D. Bowers. Uh, she was a teacher from uh, Cairo, Illinois. Uh, eventually, they had two daughters, Ethel and Clara. Uh, both died at, at infancy in 1887 and 1889. Um, they are buried without grave markers in Oak Ridge Cemetery. Uh, this was not uncommon. Uh, a lot of different uh, individuals at that time who did not have a lot of money, specifically people a part of the black population here in the Springfield area, um, just didn't have the funds to put a gravestone um, with those who uh, were buried in Oak Ridge. And uh, I know that there are uh, quite a few uh, community members today who are still trying to find uh, funds to uh, create burial markers for these individuals. 
Now, um, when he started his artistic career, um, he started by entering his works at the Sangamon County Fair, the Illinois State Fair between 1874 and 1882. Um, he won a number of awards, both first and sec second place uh, for crayon, pastel, pencil, oil, and Indian ink categories. Um, those pieces that won awards uh, would sell uh, at the minimum about a dollar and at the premium about two dollars. Um, reporters covered Williams extensively and referred to him as an intelligent, popular, worthy, um, perseverant, and energetic genius. They marveled at the quality and the amount of his work and often, often listed his portraits um, as subjects. Um, so when Williams eventually did get started and started his own studio, uh, he was able to open it above um, Salter's grocery store on the square in around 1872. During the next seven years, he stayed on the square moving above uh, Officer and Peabody's clothing store, A.E. Hall's clothing store, and Roberts and Company. By 1879, Williams had settled above Smith and Lewer's shoe store. And that was adjacent to Lincoln's former law office, and he would stay there for the rest of his life. Now, during his career, he exhibited on the square at Hart's Bookstore, Simmons Art Gallery, Ryan's Drug Store, Barclays Furniture, as well as the River Rivery House Hotel. And uh, the House of Representatives uh, in, the in the state capitol. And at the 1884 World's Fair in New Orleans, he would have some of his art on display. Now, in regards to the individuals who would come and ask him to create for him, uh, Williams would uh, have a lot of busy sessions during the legislature legislator season. Um, he had lawyers, politicians, judges, war veterans, doctors, businessmen, wives um, from all around the country come to him for portraits to be drawn um, in different mediums. Now, um, in 1884, Williams reproduced and copyrighted Alexander Gardner's 1861 photograph of Abraham Lincoln. Um, with his secretaries, John Nicolay and John Hay. Uh, Williams eventually sold the photo uh, around the country. Now, um, in 1874, the Springfield City Directory advertised crayon, pastel, and pencil descriptions, uh, depictions of nature, farms, residents, and animals. So the beginning of his career, he would just use the natural landscape. Um, but as his career, uh, moved forward, he would do a number of portraits. Um, and here are just some examples of some of the portraits he was able to draw. Um, as stated earlier, Supreme Court Justice David Davis had his um, image drawn in a crayon and in, pa in uh, charcoal. Uh, in addition to that, um, he also did a drawing of the Illinois uh, Secretary of State Asa Matthews, uh, which is in the state capitol today. Um, now, the Illinois State Museum has an image of an unidentified man uh, that he ended up drawing. And I would have to say it's a really unique uh, work because you can see the fine details and almost looks like a photograph of a person. Um, you wouldn't imagine that it would be hand drawn. Uh, he had such great talent in uh, drawing individuals in making sure that they come to life and make you question, was it a photograph or was it a drawing? Um, and he had an extreme talent in this. Now, towards the end of his life, um, if you looked at how many portraits he may have um, created throughout his career, um, you can probably count over 100 um, portraits that were drawn by him. And this wasn't counting a lot of the advertisements that he would draw as well. Um, now, the three that we have here are actually all signed by him. 
Um, so if you were to turn the images over, you would be able to see his signature. They wouldn't be on the front. Um, if you're looking for these particular images and want to see examples of his work, you can look at the Illinois State Museum and of course at the, the State Capitol today. And they also have um, Judge Davis's image at uh, the Davis Davis Man David Davis Mansion, uh, which is a state historic site, and you can visit that um, throughout the week. Now, at the end of his life, um, he was having a number of um, health issues. As a young man, he was a victim of malaria, which would last you for majority of his life. Um, and a number of individuals were actually um, suffering from the same type of illness. Um, now, an El Paso newspaper reported that um, Williams died of consumption, uh, tuberculosis, and there was no death certificate or interment record um, available for, for people to find. Um, and I know that on Sangamon Link, there's two different articles for him. You can read an article about him as an artist and his career, but you can also read about the detective story of trying to figure out more about who he was and how uh, his death has a lot of questions surrounding it. Um, now, Williams, um, towards the end of his life, um, there's no real description and evidence of him being violent or that he suffered um, from tuberculosis, mental illness, or alcohol, but he was a victim of malaria, as I stated earlier, but that was quite common. So it didn't make it um, unrealistic for him to die of those um, illnesses that he had earlier and as they've continued throughout his life. Um, now, it was quite common in the United States, including Illinois in the 1880s. Um, the death rate in Illinois for malaria in 1890 was about 19 per 19 people per 100,000 persons. Um, so it was quite common. Um, now he had com complications from being treated uh, for malaria. Now for those who are interested in medical history, um, the CW Gill's drug store in town, um, which was listed as his doctor's office, sold um, electric bitters, uh, which was the malaria treatment at the time. Um, now, what they were, uh, were they were patent medicines that often made patients feel better temporarily because they contained alcohol with morphine, opium, or cocaine. However, they did not really cure the illness um, and sometimes caused addiction which could have led to a lot of the complications he had and ultimately led to his, his death. Now, there's another story that goes around uh, William's death. It wasn't just um, the bitters that he took um, or the fact he had alcohol uh, when he was um, picked up by two detectives um, in El Paso, um, but he could have also been a, a victim of racial neglect um, and violence. And Texas at the time, uh, which is where he was when he passed away, was the third highest state in the US in the number of lynchings and most of its victims were African-Americans. Now, if you're wanting to know where Williams is actually buried, um, he's buried in Cairo City Cemetery uh, in Villa Ridge, Illinois. Now, um, in studying a lot of his life, um, his artwork was beautiful, but you could tell that he had to create himself. Um, he spent a lot of time practicing. He spent a lot of time trying to discover and, and hone his talent um, in the midst of trying to uh, feed his family and uh, take care of the ones that he loved. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he was constantly up against uh, racial biases of his era. Uh, so what makes him a trailblazer is an individual who came up from slavery and made himself. Um, and he decided to do that here in Springfield, Illinois.
So if you're interested in this work, I highly encourage you to uh, reach out to the Illinois State Museum, the State Capitol, um, and even go to the Davis Mansion and take a look at the works that we do have here in the state um, and look at his technique um, and take a look at the digital archives of uh, the Illinois State Register and Journal. This will give you an a insightful look on how he was able to cultivate his audience. Now, as we continue on our journey in discovering more about artists, we turn into the 20th century and 20th century art. Um, and this is where it gets exciting because some of these artists are still around today. So we have David Hammonds. Now, David Hammonds uh, was born in Springfield in 1943. He was the 10th child um, of his mother, uh, and she was a single mom. Um, she was very uh, private, and he eventually was himself um, a private man. Um, he's unwilling, he was unwilling to have his biography um, to frame to his work. Uh, he wanted that disconnect between himself and his art. Now, um, in studying his work, um, he tended to be a little bit more uh, connected to the civil rights movement, the black power movement, um, not just here in Illinois, but also when he eventually moved out to California. Um, so in studying the early part of his life, um, the family, like many African-American families, struggled to make ends meet during World War II. Um, his mother found that life was considerably harder um, at the height of the Second World War. And uh, Hammonds would later say, quote, I still don't know how we get how we got by. Uh, as a young child in the late 1940s, Hammonds witnessed firsthand the injustices facing African-Americans living under segregation, uh, developing a keen awareness of social and radical um, and racial disparities. Now, at school, Hammonds was not really uh, academically inclined. Uh, he was in, instead encouraged to um, take a vocational course um, and take more of the lower paying jobs. Um, he showed an early talent for drawing and art, but found them so easy that he developed uh, a disdain for them. And he decided he just didn't want to do art. Uh, this seems to be kind of um, a little bit similar to a previous artist that we talked about. Um, he was seemingly uninterested in the art historical canon that he learned about in school. Um, and he later on would say he didn't like art. Um, but like an affliction, he claims uh, that he was born to it. Um, again, that's kind of how Dennis Williams was in his life, that he was born into becoming an artist. He was meant to. Now, um, in his early work um, in 1962, at the age of 19, he left Illinois for Los Angeles. And there he attended um, the Los Angeles City College for a year and then won, went on to study advertising at Los Angeles Trade Technical College um, between 1968 and 1972. He took evening classes at Otis Art, Arts Institute um, and then eventually married um, a young lady in 1966 uh, by the name of Rebecca Williams. Eventually, the couple would divorce in 1972. Um, now, while he was at Otis, he studied with Charles White, the African-American painter, printmaker, and muralist um, who had worked for the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, uh, in the 1930s. Um, for Hammonds, White was a important early influence on his work. Um, and particularly his belief in art was changed by him um, because it was a belief that art could be a form of activism and a vehicle for social change. So White's presence uh, at Otis uh, and Hammonds interactions with him um, at the height of the Black Power movement um, 
and black cultural nationalism um, would affect quite a bit of Hammond's work. Um, now, as we look at some of his work that we have here, um, in 1969, I only choose, chose one of his works um, because I thought it was very interesting. It really intrigued me when I first saw it. Um, but it's called Pray for America. It was created in 1969. And um, this particular work um, was one of his early body prints. Um, and it was created while uh, he was in Los Angeles. And um, it was meant to be performative in nature, um, to make the Prince Hammonds coated himself in cooking fat or margarine, then rolled around on the canvas, imprinting his face and body, and then um, sprinkled pigment over the grease to reveal a ghostly outline against a plain white background. Um, they gave an appearance of an x-ray-like image um, and most of the time were politically charged symbols like the American flag, which you see in this image. Um, for his body prints, Hammonds experimented with the use of unusual or poor materials, working with um, similar uh, with a, within a similar vein of artists um, affiliated with the Arte Pervora, um, the performative aspect of the body prints and the use of everyday materials is also reminiscent of the Neo Data, particularly um, Klein's uh, series of Robert Rosenberg's late scale cameraless photographs made in collaboration with his then wife Susan Well. However, in their use of the body, Hammond's prints also reflected the rise of body art in Los Angeles in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, this particular image um, was to reflect the influence of Charles White, who I talked about earlier, um, but also um, was used as a uh, figuration and a commentary on racism. And it also reflected the corners of the Black Arts Movement. Um, a hist art historian by the name of Kelly Jones has noted that in body prints, quote, the fulcrum of significant, uh, sorry, signification revolved around the performative body. Uh, Hammonds was the dynamic agent uh, collapsing the position of um, editor with those of signifer and signified. Um, so this piece of art was actually created um, in a way to showcase um, racism at the time. And uh, it also uh, was a part of the black movement body art culture. Now, um, during this time, Watts, um, and, the, and sorry, in the wake of the Watts rebellions and the assassination of Malcolm X in 65, um, a lot of black art became overly political. Um, and the black arts movement um, encouraged a quote, black aesthetic, um, the creation of art to build and foster community. Uh, and finding new and more uh, democratic ways to make and show work. So in the 60s, um, during the Watts Rebellion, um, Hammonds and other Black artists uh, were showcasing their work in the streets. Um, according to, um, again, Kelly Jones, who's an, an art critic that I spent a lot of time looking at her work because she was really um, great at describing this pr particular movement. Um, but she ended up stating, quote, it changed people's expectations and the way they looked at the world, changed artists' approach, approach to their craft and their materials and led them to question what art might be able to do. Um, as he progressed in his career in the 1970s, um, he became connected with the world of art, not only in Los Angeles, but he was well known in New York um, and continued his work. Now, um, in the 80s, um, 
up until the 1990s, um, New York introduced a larger world of Hammond's work. Um, now, in 1990, uh, he was awarded the MacArthur Guinness Grant in order to directly assess uh, Hammond's and his legacy. The CCA Watts Institute for Contemporary Arts in San Francisco uh, brought together a group of artists, curators, and art historians to explore and discuss his work. In the end, Hammond's um, in the end, for Hammonds to be an artist is to make his life his art. Um, and he still continues to create his art today. Um, Hammonds made a huge impact during um, the civil rights movements um, and the Black Power movement. Um, but he also continues to bring awareness to racial injustice. And it's very interesting to see the continuation of his work. Um, even though he is in the older state, elder stage of life in his late seventies, he's still um, moving and shaking the art world. The next person I'm bringing up is more uh, in uh, my age bracket. I grew up seeing Jay Manuel on uh, America's Next Top Model. Um, and when I was doing some research on uh, African-Americans in the arts from the central Illinois area, the last person I thought of was Jay Manuel because I connect him with uh, Canada and um, the East, well, the West Coast um, in connection to the East Coast because of the fashion movement. Um, so to find out that he came from Springfield, Illinois, well, that was a bit surprising to me. Um, as I dove more into his, his history, um, though he was born here, uh, his mother was Italian. Um, and um, then he also had uh, a Czech descendant and a South um, African father. Um, and he was of mixed Cape Malay descent. Now, um, he was raised by adoptive parents in Toronto eventually, um, where he attended uh, Dr. Norman uh, Collegiate Institute and York University uh, before entering the fashion industry. Um, he was a pre-med student um, and he also studied opera, which I thought was also pretty neat. You don't really come across a lot of people um, studying opera uh, nowadays. So it's really cool to see um, the early beginnings and what they wanted to do. Um, because as most of us know, when we go to college, we go in with an idea of what we want to achieve, what, what career path we want to go down, but it ends up changing in the end. Um, so he has worked in the business of managing to aesthetic um, for seven years, and he worked as a makeup artist for Stylist for Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, uh, Mary Claire, Victoria's Secret, Revlon, and CoverGirl. Uh, he joined America's Next Top Model in its first cycle in 2003 uh, as a creative director. Um, and for nine years, he fe was featured on every cycle of the show, becoming one of the biggest shows in the United States during this period. After 18 seasons with the show, Nigel Barker and Jay Alexander didn't return for the 19th cycle as their contracts were not renewed. Now, following the announcement, Manuel decided to leave the show. Um, it was a controversial move by Tyra Banks um, that led to a media frenzy around Manuel's um, and the show. The radical personnel change did not work and the show was canceled three years later, being renewed on December 12th, um, 2016 on VH1. Um, he was the host uh, and lead judge of the second and third cycles of Canada's Next Top Model, um, which is an offshoot of America's Next Top Model. Uh, he made a camo appearance in Degrassi Takes Manhattan, um, as well as playing himself in an episode of the comedy drama television series, um, Being Erica. In 2011, he released a clothing line for Sears Canada by the name of Attitude. And in 2014, uh, he launched J. Manuel Beauty. Um, and it's a line of cosmetics based on a filter finished collection. Um, 
Now, he announced that he was a judge for the Miss, Amer Miss Universe in 2017, um, which is a beauty pageant. And he was one of the six final judges who crowned Demi Lee Nell Peters as Miss University in 2017 um, in Nevada. Now, um, he continues to do a lot of work within the fashion industry. He has a, an Instagram page, Facebook page, a YouTube show, um, and he is still continuing to break down barriers um, within the fashion industry. Um, but what's interesting is the fact that he was living here in Springfield, Illinois, um, at the early beginnings of his life, um, and he was able to grow and thrive and expand his career outside of the state, uh, which made him a trailblazer uh, within his own right. Now, as we move forward, um, I'm getting to the photography section and we're only going to talk about one because there's one really big project going on uh, right now with the Illinois State Archives um, regarding um, photography of one particular um, photographer and his name was Doc Helm. Now, uh, Doc Helm was um, a famous photographer who uh, spent a lot of time um, taking photos for um, the political individuals within the state. Um, so in studying his career, we are able to find out more about the African-American community. Now, um, he's called Doc Helm, uh, whenever he's discussed among historians and archivists, um, but his legal name is Eddie Winfred Helm. Um, he documented the African-American life in Springfield for over 50 years. Um, he started his career as uh, the man responsible for raising and lowering the flag over the Illinois State House. Um, so he grew up in Mount Vernon um, and got the nickname Doc because it of one of his first jobs was delivering prescriptions for a local pharmacy. Um, now, according to his daughter, Beverly, um, when she was interviewed by Renfro uh, in 2010 and um, by Mark Depew at the Presidential Library and Museum, which you can listen to that, it's on their website. Um, and it's a part of the oral history program that they have at the Presidential Museum. But according to her, um, he became very interested in photography while he was still quite young in Mount Vernon, um, but had no special career in mind uh, and no plans to go to college. Uh, so in 1934, an uncle with a political connection got Helm a job with the Illinois Secretary of State's office, um, and Helm eventually moved to Springfield. And uh, he became... Uh, one of the individuals who worked for him. Uh, now, the Secretary of State is the custodian of the Capitol complex, uh, which led Helm to one of his first duties. Um, he started putting the flag on top of the Capitol building. Um, now, you had no harness or anything to protect you. So if you've seen our state capitol, um, it's quite high. Um, and so if you're scared of heights, this is not the job for you. <laughs> um, but Doc was able to do it. Now, um, in the early 1940s, Helm moved to a position microfilming documents for the Illinois State Library, uh, which is another subdivision of the Secretary of State's office. Now, um, he asked the head librarian at the time if he could develop some film because they had a photo lab within the State Library. Um, and she allowed him to do that on his lunch break. Um, and that's what he ended up doing. Now, um, recently, and I'm going to get into this a little bit because it's, it's so cool that we're able to take a look at his images because uh, May 18th of 2020, um, the Illinois State Archives was awarded um, over $60,000 in federal grant money to preserve, digitize, and provide online access to 21,000 photographs taken by Doc. Um, so it's really cool to see that his large collection is going to be available for everyone to uh, take a look at. Now, he served as the official state photographer for half a century 
um, from the 1940s to 1992. Uh, during this time, he took pictures of presidents, governors, celebrities, citizens, notable events, and ordinary day-to-day -day operations of state government. Um, and here I have some uh, selections of his work. Um, so during the time he was the official photographer, um, he did take some uh, some images of African American life in Illinois, um, and this is from uh, a picture of some children who have been staying in some tents in what is known as the Badlands neighborhood. Um, and these tents were where they were supposed to live temporarily because um, the hay homes were destroyed at this time. Um, and you can see this particular image within the Sangamon Valley collection. Um, and those you can actually take a look at um, if you're able to venture out there um, at the public library. Now, um, eventually um, his photographs will be made available um, for people to see. Um, what's been very interesting is the development of Doc's collection um, with the State Archives, but also the Illinois State Museum had a wonderful exhibit on uh, Doc's uh, photograph collection. And it's thanks to his daughter that we are able to have uh, quite a number of these digitized. Now here is what well, a entertainment photo that was taken by Doc. Um, and this was of the jazz drummer, um, a man, Jump Jackson, um, who fronted his own band. Uh, so that's one of his images that he was able to take. Now, I like this particular images because it shows uh, the arts and entertainment uh, here in Springfield. Um, but what's really unique about it is you don't find a lot of um, African-American music groups being pictured. Uh, most of the time I'm able to find uh, images of um, white bands coming in, but we did have a significant number of African-American jazz groups come into the Springfield area. Which leads me to my next section. Um, the reason why I'm going to pass up a little bit about Doc Helm is because I know that the State Archives is going to be talking about him for quite some time. Um, and I also really want you to go and check out their collection um, because Doc, after serving for over 50 years, um, has a large collection. Um, and you can learn so much about um, a population by the photographs that were taken, uh, by the clothing they wore, um, the events they participated in, but also just um, how our politicians interacted with different groups of people. Um, and so, I highly recommend that you get a chance to take a look at the collection uh, through the State Archives, the State Museum, as well as the African American History Museum's exhibit on Doc Helm. And we are very fortunate here at um, the University of Illinois at Springfield to have students working on digitizing this collection. Um, and they've been cataloging them for quite some time. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product. So we're going to work on looking at musicians next. Um, so the musicians that I'm going to be highlighting, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that my music will work for this. Um, for those of you who love ragtime, jazz, blues, um, I have some artists for you in this program. Um, growing up, uh, I listened to a lot of big band and swing, uh, but ragtime music has its own um, rhythm to it and it actually is a lot more fun to, to kind of dance to. Um, so the first artist that I have here, um, his name is Artie Matthews. Now for those of you who are familiar with Louis Armstrong or even um, some um, Cab Calloway um, and King Oliver and Jelly Roll Morton. Uh, Matthews wrote a lot of music that um, these musicians ended up playing, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, so Artie Matthews, he's an acclaimed ragtime composer, 
Um, he started as a musician in the bars and bordellos of Springfield's Old Levy District. Um, a lot of his music you can find sheet music of, but recordings of it are kind of hard to find um, with him featured in it. But I was able to find a recording that Louis Armstrong did in Chicago in 19, uh, I want to say in 1925. Um, but a lot of his sheet music has been re-recorded multiple times um, since the 19 teens. Now, um, he composed uh, ragtime classics such as Weary Blues, which was later recorded by Louis Armstrong, as I mentioned earlier. Um, now, he turned to studying and performing and teaching classical, religious, and choral music. He and his wife, Anna, who is also a musician, eventually opened the Cosmo Cosmopolitan School of Music in Cincinnati, Ohio. So eventually they moved out of the Springfield area. Um, this became uh, the first conservatory of its own kind in the country, and perhaps even the world, uh, being owned by an African by African Americans um, and focused on all forms of music, encouraging young black performers to embrace more than just ragtime and blues. Um, now, uh, this particular conservatory uh, influenced a number of future black artists that would eventually go on to perform uh, classical music, um, but most of it focused around the piano. Now, um, Matthews, while um, born in northern Illinois, grew up in Springfield. Um, his father was a coal miner. Uh, his name was Samuel Matthews. And his father ended up passing away when he was about seven years old. Uh, his mother, Mary, um, was uh, Matthews' original music teacher, which is always, it's really cool to see what families are able to bond over music. Um, now, Matthews was first exposed to ragtime piano music in the early 1900s, um, although his talents um, went beyond just the piano. Um, according to the Biographical Dictionary of Afro-American Musicians, uh, which was put together in 1982, um, they ended up summarizing Matthews' music beginnings in Springfield um, this way. Quote, about 1905, he began playing uh, rag piano, learning it from um, Banty Morgan and Art Dunningham, who played the local, played in local brothel, brothels and clubs. He also began to play professionally with his string trio on street corners in local cafes and saloons. Um, his mentors remain a mystery, uh, but neither Morgan whom Edwards describes simply as um, a dope addict, nor Dunningham, sometimes repeated as Dullingham, um, appears in Springfield newspapers or directories from the period. Um, they came up only about Matthew's early career, and none of those um, reports indicate where that information originated. So we have to be very careful when we study our primary source materials because we can hear oral histories um, but without pairing them with primary sources, we start to question some of the stories that we have heard from these artists. Um, but within the African-American community, uh, oral histories are very important um, because most of the time that's how we hear about the lives of individuals um, because there are not a lot of rec written, rec written records at this time. Um, so, uh, as he uh, progressed in his music, um, he eventually um, performs at school Christmas pageants, um, and he ends up uh, starting to write his own music. Uh, his family only appears in city directories uh, sporadically. Um, in 1904, uh, the 16-year-old Artie still lived with his mother and rented rooms on South 10th Street. Um, his occupation was listed simply as a porter in 1904. Um, but in the 1908 directory, um, it calls Matthews as a musician, indicating that he may already have been making a living as a performer. Um, so he turned to different styles of music as he grew, um, beginning about 1916, uh, eventually relocating to Chicago and then Cincinnati. Uh, where he and Anna opened up the Cosmopolitan School of Music in 1921. 
Um, we go on to look and see what different parts of uh, music he portrayed, his, he ends up writing. One of them, as I stated earlier, um, was uh, the Weary Blues, but he also uh, created other types of music, um, such as the um, uh, Ragtime Pastimes, which is one through five. Um, so the music that I'm going to play for you here, if it'll work, oh, it won't let me do it. Um, I encourage you to look it up. There's a 1925 video of Louis Armstrong, which is what I was planning on playing for you today, um, of him uh, performing the Weary Blues, uh, Weary Blue. Um, now, if you go into the 1940s, you'll get a chance to see Glenn Miller and um, uh, the sisters performing uh, Weary Blues. Weary Blue. Now, if you're interested in this particular performance and um, Artie Matthews' writing of it, what's so neat about it is Weary Blue was actually a poem written by Langston Hughes, another famous African American from the Central Illinois area who went to school in Lincoln, Illinois, which is north of Sangamon County in Logan County. Um, and that particular poem, uh, the lyrics for Weary Blue was moved into that. So it's really interesting to see uh, the dynamics that connect uh, the different communities throughout the Central Illinois area. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Artie Matthews, there is an article on Singman Link, but I encourage you to also uh, look at his son's webpage. His son is actually um, a performer as well. And he wrote a biography about his father, Artie Matthews, and he still teaches today. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to see the legacy of his father continue on through him and his children. Um, so it'll get an opportunity to see that as well. Um, and in addition to that, he provides uh, selections from Artie's uh, compositions for his students in teaching them how to play. Um, so that's very uh, interesting to see uh, one child's view of their parent and being able to pass on the legacy to the next generation of artists. Um, the next person I bring up, there's not really a lot of information about him. I was only able to uh, find information about Lewis Happy Evans um, through an article for a completely different person. So Happy was uh, the uh, conductor for the Springfield Municipal Colored Band. Now, um, back in the um, 1936, um, so like the, the mid 1930s, uh, there were two municipal bands within Springfield. You had the white band and you had the colored one. Um, now in researching this, I could not find a picture of the colored band, but I could find one of the white band, um, which was disheartening. So if you do find one, let me know, because um, I'm very interested to see Happy Evans leading his band. Um, so um, back uh, in the 1930s, um, they were separated. Um, now, they did not merge the two bands until 1956. Now, Happy Evans, who was um, the lead of the band until the segregate, segregated units were merged, um, he started in around 1941 as the director. Now, although most of his working life uh, was spent as an employee of the Illinois Secretary of State. Evans had a distinguished music background. Uh, he studied uh, counterpoint, harmony, and technique at Oberlin Conservatory of Music, um, and he did additional studies at the Chicago Conservatory of Music. Um, in 1940, the Illinois State Journal reported that the Springfield Municipal Color Band um, was the only African-American band in the United States supported by municipal taxes. Um, there's a plaque on the Lou Holland uh, band shell in Douglas Park, um, which is now the Duncan Park, um, where the Springfield Municipal Band uh, played plays most of its concerts. Now, um, there are some who do remember Happy. 
um, and have been recorded in oral histories that were collected by the Sangamon State University, which is University of Illinois Springfield. Um, now, as um, time has passed, um, we've been able to recognize this specific group of unique individuals who were able to do performances. Um, and what I think will be interesting is to see down the road if more images start popping up um, from personal collections um, of this group of very fine uh, individuals who decided to bring the love of music to the community. The next person I'm bringing up, uh, I actually just came upon him when I was doing my research. Um, for those of you who are uh, fans of Prince, Morris Day is uh, gonna be really exciting for you because Morris Day actually went to school with Prince um, and eventually uh, starred in the movie Purple Rain. Uh, he was actually the uh, antagonist within the film production. Now, I only have a little bit to talk about him because there's not really a whole lot available. There are a number of interviews of Morris Day talking about uh, his friendship with Prince. Um, but what I was mostly interested in was his life in Springfield, um, which he lived here until his teenagers. So um, Morris Day was born um, December 13th, 1957 in Springfield. Um, and he was, his legal name is Morris Eugene Day. Um, he is an actor, a composer, um, known for Purple Rain that was, uh, that came out in 1984. Um, he's also known for The Adventures of Ford Fairline in 1990. And Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back in 2001. Um, he was at one point married to Judith Jones. Um, he was the lead singer of The Time, which came out with its hits like Jungle Love and Jerk Out, um, and was in a band in high school called Champagne with his childhood friends, Prince and Andre Simone. Now, uh, contrary to rumors, he and Prince were not cousins. Um, and some people mistake the fact that he was born in Springfield and then eventually moved to Minneapolis when he was about 13 years old. Um, so he didn't live in Minneapolis his whole life. He lived in Springfield until he was about 13 and then moved to Minneapolis where he then met Prince. Um, he still performs today um, at uh, the Super Bowl. He ended up doing kind of a recognition of Prince, um, which was really cool to see. Um, in addition to that, uh, he's done a number of interviews and he's also done a number of comeback tours as well. Um, so it's really fun to talk about some of the contemporary artists that uh, we have uh, here in central Illinois that originated here, but uh, ended up uh, developing their own skills and talents uh, later on down the line in other, um, other states. Now, um, Today, I, I talked quite a bit about our um, history of musicians, artists, and um, individuals who had a musical impact here in Central Illinois. Um, and I'm interested to learn about um, African Americans who uh, had a musical influence or an artistic influence in your life. Um, and if you think that there are individuals today who have continued their legacy um, throughout their life here in Central Illinois um, and how they're expressing it. Um, so as we go through our journey of discovering a lot of these uh, community trailblazers, uh, keep a lookout uh, because there are individuals within our communities that may be a little bit more quiet, um, may have some hidden talents that uh, eventually will uh, outshine. And uh, I look forward to seeing what creations they bring um, into the world here in Springfield. Um, in addition, there's a mural that's being created for the uh, Abraham Lincoln Capitol Airport that's going to highlight a lot of rich history here uh, from Central Illinois. Um, and I look forward to seeing the individuals that they pick um, 
from the history books. Uh, but in addition to that, to seeing if we will call on some of our local artists to come in and contribute uh, to the unique artistic culture that we have here, um, both with music, art, photography. Um, there are so many talents uh, that are kind of hidden within our own communities um, that I hope to see more of in the future. So again, if you have any questions for me, feel free to put them in the comments. If not, um, I want to thank you for showing up uh, to this program. I hope you learned something new um, about some of the local individuals within our Black community here in Central Illinois. Um, it is my hope that in the future programs that I can invite some of these individuals on to um, the events that we host uh, throughout the month of February and highlighting these individuals um, because it's it brings more to the story. Um, and also I, I fully admit that a lot of what I've been doing is researching them um, and learning about them on my own. Um, and for those who have grown up uh, with some historic people within the Central Illinois area, I wanna hear from you uh, because our history is not just um, what I'm able to dig up on research, but it's also the story of the people who live here, who, is, who have lived through history itself um, and has come in contact um, with some key significant events that should be remembered within our county's history um, and within our states. So I wanna thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you next time when we talk about desegregating Lincoln's Springfield. We will be talking about the desegregation of education. Um, also, we'll be focused on uh, the desegregation of our beaches. Yes, Springfield has a few beaches, whether uh, they be of lake or large bodies of water. Um, we do have segregated beaches in our Springfield history. Um, in addition to that, um, we'll be talking about uh, desegregation of, of city government that made federal news. Um, so come and join me next Thursday at one o'clock and we'll discuss some of the, the steps that our community has made um, in regards to uh, making Springfield a more welcoming place um, for all. And I encourage you to, to come back next time, not only with questions, but also what do you hope um, for the future? Um, how can we end Black History Month by learning um, from our past, but also what do we hope for the future? How can we make our communities better um, and more welcoming for those who live here, but also those who are hoping to come to the Central Illinois area? So looking forward to speaking to you next time and hearing from you. Again, this is Ann Mosley with the Sangamon Experience, uh, talking about our African-American trailblazers here in Central Illinois, focusing on Sangamon County. Hope to see you next time and have a wonderful day.